This is the Story Punks podcast, a show where we talk about all the punks. So steampunk, diesel punk, cyberpunk, and all the other punks. I'm your host, Cindy Grigg. It's episode nine with Malka Older. I'm so excited to share this cyberpunk interview with you. Malka has an amazing series and I will just jump right into our sponsorship by Audible. I'm always on the hunt for good audiobooks and Malka Older's Infomocracy absolutely pulled me in and I felt smarter just listening to it. By the way, you're going to feel smarter just listening to this interview where we talk about Infomocracy and that's book one in the Sentinel Cycle series. But if you really want to get into some of these ideas that we'll be talking about, then go ahead and listen to the audiobook. You could also read, but then you won't get Christine Marshall's performance. She does an amazing job as narrator of the audiobook version of Infomocracy. So this, again, this is a story about micro democracies in a near future world. So it, it features diverse characters. They're moving among these social structures. It's really intricate. It's a thriller, but it's also just got this cyberpunk cool. So I absolutely loved it. If you are interested in seeing my running list of recommendations for punk related audiobooks, or you want to click through and sign up for Audible and make this your first book and a free first book, uh, audiobook, then you can go to storypunks.world forward slash audible. Without further ado, let's get into this interview with Malka Older. Malka Older is a writer, aid worker, and PhD candidate named Senior Fellow for Technology and Risk at the Carnegie Council for Ethics in International Affairs for 2015, she has more than a decade of experience in humanitarian aid and development, ranging from field-level service experience as a head of office in Darfur to supporting global programs and agency-wide strategy as a disaster risk reduction technical specialist. In between, she has designed and implemented economic development initiatives in post-disaster context, supervised a large and diverse portfolio as director of programs in Indonesia, and responded to complex emergencies and natural disasters in Sri Lanka, Uganda, Darfur, Indonesia, Japan, and Mali in the last three as team leader. Her doctoral work on the sociology of organizations at the Spenspo explores the dynamics of multi-level governance and disaster response using the cases of Hurricane Katrina and Japan tsunami of 2011. As part of this work, she has been selected as a visiting scholar at Columbia University on an Alliance grant and at the Fletcher School of International Affairs at Tufts University. She has an undergraduate degree in literature from Harvard and a master's in international relations and economics from the School of Advanced International Studies, Johns Hopkins University. She has also conducted research for the French Institute of Nuclear Safety on the human and organizational factors involved in the Fukushima Daiichi crisis. Her science fiction political thriller, Infomocracy, was named one of the best books of 2016 by Kirkus, Book Riot, and The Washington Post. She is also the author of the sequels, Null States in 2017 and State Tectonics in 2018, as well as of short fiction appearing in Wired, 12 Tomorrows, Reservoir Journal, Fireside Fiction, Tor.com, and others. So welcome onto the show, Malka. So excited to speak with you about all this experience and of course, your amazing cyberpunk fiction. Thank you. It's great to be here. I really appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. So in this show, we discuss the punks. And of course, today we're focusing on cyberpunk. What is your take on the term? Everybody has a different definition. And it really helps when we all inform each other's work by, by talking about what, what does cyberpunk mean? So I, I think this is a great question, and I actually wrote a little bit about it for Tor.com um, when my book first came out, and there was talk about whether it was cyberpunk or post-cyberpunk and what that even means. Um, but one of the conclusions I came to, besides the fact that, you know, they called it post-cyberpunk, and that made me a little bit sad just because I like cyberpunk, and I didn't want there to be, you know, I didn't want to suggest that it was over already. Um, oh, totally, totally. <laughs> uh, but, but I also see the point, because we are in a very different place in our cyber world than we were um, when Neuromancer came out in the 80s. So 
you know, obviously things have changed and we're not looking into the future in the same kind of way. Uh, but at the same time, you know, our, the cyber, the, the technologies we use, the social technologies that inform them, um, all of our, the cyber part of our experience is changing so rapidly that I think there's still a lot of uncertainty about the future and there's still a lot of room for writing um, that kind of, uh, you know, future, futuristic narratives that deal with the unexpectedness and the unexpected consequences and um, the newness and the strangeness of, of cyber everything. Um, but I think what I really like about your question is that for me, when I thought about it to write this piece, the important part of that is really the punk part. And we know that in part because there have been so many spin-offs of this cyberpunk phrase. So we have steampunk, we have silkpunk, we have, there are a lot of other punks, <laughs> um, some of which may only have, you know, one work in their category, um, but a lot of which have, have many more, you know, they're, they're, a lot of genres based on this. And I think it's really worthwhile to go back and look at what we're actually trying to say when we talk about something being punk. And I do think that that also ties in to a lot of the appeal of the original cyberpunk. It's not just the cyber part that people found cool and interesting. It's also the, the punk perspective, which I think involves having characters that are really on the margins of whatever is going on um, in terms of government and industry and, you know, whether it's a monolithic sort of corporation or whether it's a, a bunch of governments that are kind of stayed and set in their ways or, you know, whatever the sort of major power is in these books, the, the, the characters that we identify with are usually working in some way at the outside of it. They're either working against it or they're working past it or they're just trying to scrounge out an existence outside of the normal um, ways of doing things. And because it's cyberpunk, you know, most of it is about them using tech to do this. Um, they are people who have, you know, because of the nature of tech as something that's on the edge of the, the present in these worlds, something that's right on the future, because of their positioning at the margins, they're able to use that tech in ways to either jump over or undermine or game the system. Um, and so I think that's a really important element of what we're talking about, whether the tech is cyber tech or whether it's steam tech in a uh, alt history type of world or um, whether it's tech that comes in a different way. I mean, when we talk about silk punk, if you look at the, the J.Y. Yang novellas, um, they have a really interesting take on, on what tech can look like. Um, so, so, you know, I think that that is a, a super important thing to to both hold on to sort of thematically and, and understand and, and use as a reference as we, as we talk about what is cyberpunk and what isn't. And the conclusion I came to thinking about this is that my work is kind of meso-cyberpunk. Um, yes, it's not, <laughs> love the new term. <laughs> it's not quite post, um, because as I said, you know, it's still in a future that's a little bit beyond where we are now. Um, and the characters are... Some of them are, are within the system, but they're kind of, you know, they're, they're at a, they're positioned within the system in a way where they have a certain amount of distrust, a certain amount of autonomy. Um, some of them are completely outside of it and are very punk and working against it. And some of them are, are in it, but questioning and trying to figure out ways that they can use their superior understanding of technology, often because of an outsider viewpoint, um, to make things better and to, to enact change upon this, this larger power structure. Oh, absolutely. I can really see that from jumping into book one in your series. And I really appreciate you talking about the thread that unites all the different punks. I mean, obviously I have this show and so I'm really interested in exploring how all those intersect or overlap. And I just loved, yeah, again, a new term and it's at least I've never heard mezzo. That's all yours. I think Malka. <laughs> um, well, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of work, you know, I think there are a lot of people out there who are still trying to make sense of the cyber world in this way where, you know, we're all kind of within it at this point. Like, it's very hard to imagine people who are completely um, on the outskirts. But actually, there was a, a, a news story and there was someone who I wish I remember his name and maybe can find it to cite, who, who tweeted about a news story um, about people, uh, a group of I think a nonprofit who are trying to set up connections to the internet for people in Detroit who are either 
squatters or for whatever other reason didn't have access. And he said, these are the real cyberpunks. And you know, that, that is an excellent point too, because there are the people who are not connected into the cyber world the way we are. And looking at, at those kinds of margins is another way to explore this term. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So for anyone who has not yet jumped into your Sentinel Cycle series, can you give us an overview and share what the major themes are? What can readers expect? Sure. So um, my book's starting with Infomocracy. They take place about 60 years from now uh, in the future in which the nation state is essentially over, although there are a couple of remnants uh, around the world that cling to this sort of outmoded um, version of governance, but most of the world participates in what's called micro-democracy. Uh, this means that the basic jurisdictional unit is 100,000 people, give or take. Um, and these units, so this, it's based on population, which means that could be a couple of really dense city blocks in somewhere like Dhaka or <clears throat> Beijing or New York. Or it could be, you know, hundreds of square miles of a more rural area, a uh, more sparsely populated area. And each of these 100,000 uh, chunks, which I call sentinels, um, is able to vote in the election for any government that it wants out of all the governments that exist in this world, in this, this global system. Um, so there are governments that are very much based on policy. Uh, there are governments that are sort of very uh, corporate tied in um, and have kind of aspirational names and paint themselves in, in certain ways, but also have policies designed to ensure that their products are being as profitable as possible. Um, there are uh, governments that are kind of based around the ideas of the old nation states that are tied to a, a vestigial national identity and base their policies around that, whether it's through the types of tax structure that people were used to when they lived in that country or whether it's sort of cultural holidays and phenomenon. Um, and there are a lot more sort of s small quirky ones as well, uh, like, you know, the Hello Kitty government, which is really focused on cosplay and cute characters. I absolutely um, loved it. I had to <laughs> rewind when I was listening. I was like, did she just say Hello Kitty? <laughs> it was awesome. And, and they do very well economically. I mean, no one would, would be surprised by that. So, um, so they have all these different governments. A lot of them are quite localized. So, you know, there's some governments that really just focus on a specific place in the world and that's all they kind of try to contest and that's all they think about governing. And then there are others that are very global and that may have constituents in these small units spread all over the world. Um, and any, again, anyone in the world and any of these, these sentinels can vote for them. And Malka, uh, so when, not to interrupt you, but are there about 2000 of these? Did I pick up on that right? There are roughly 2,000 different governments. Um, okay. As I said, many of them quite small, but some of them also quite big. Uh, so you get the sense there's about, you know, probably 20 to 30 that are some degree of the global level, um, either re regional or, or really, really global and large. Um, and so what you have then is if you live in a city, you could be crossing into a different government, essentially a different country, when you cross the street. Um, and conversely, for the governments, they have to deal with having constituents all over the world. Um, this system is then facilitated by the existence of a global information management bureaucracy called, you know, very creatively, I think, information. Um, and so this is a bureaucracy, you can think of it kind of as a combination of the UN and Google. It, they're really about collecting all the information in the world, but also at the same time making it instantly available to everybody. So it's it's not the sort of government surveillance that we're used to reading about in dystopias or um, experiencing in the world, um, or the kind of corporate surveillance capitalism that we're seeing now quite a lot. Um, it's at least in theory, really a principle of, of transparency and trying to make everything available to everybody equally and free. Um, and not only do they want to make all this information available easily, they actually are really quite proactive about pushing it into your face, especially when it comes up in situations of politics, um, because a lot of their reason for existing has to do with making this micro-democracy work, um, but also things like, you know, in, in corporate advertisements or so on. When there's a lie uh, in an advertisement, in a political speech, it tends to get pretty quickly jumped on and annotated you know, and this is not something that you sign up for or choose. You're going to get the annotations pushed in your face if you're watching a, a 
a political speech that isn't really hewing to the truth. Um, so this is the, you know, you have these, these, these two kind of innovations in the world. One is this micro-democracy where um, citizenship is no longer really tied to geography, um, except at this kind of micro scale of, of your 100,000 closest neighbors. Um, and on the other hand, this, this insistence on information as a public good uh, and also uh, something really necessary for the democracy to work. What I have noticed right away is as I was entering this world that you've created, it's really fascinating that the people that are quite political, they can enter new political zones and they have to like check it out and they don't, they don't quite know the rules and they're, they're always investigating that. And that's such an amazing concept. You know, we're, we have a relatively limited number of political structures in our world. And so that really struck me. I thought, oh, that, that would be so adventurous. And so, I mean, it would, you would constantly be on an adventure if you were traveling in that way. Yeah, I mean, for me, a lot of the appeal of this system is the diversity. I mean, I'm someone who loves to travel and I love seeing something different from what I know. Um, uh, so that's, that's part of it. And certainly I was thinking about um, traveling in, let's say, Europe, where you have relative ease of crossing borders. Um, but even if you go back, what is it now, 15 years or 20 years? Um, you were in a situation where there would be different currencies when you crossed each border. So even though there was barely any border control, uh, you still had to deal with a complete change of not just political system, but even the money that you were using. Um, and still, you know, you, you have now um, the, the money for the moment, at least, is, is unitary, but you do have uh, the means of, of moving very quickly. And to a certain extent, you know, we have that in the U.S. as well, because we do have uh, different cultures across different states. You have different laws across different states. And even within a single municipality, um, if you look at, at a, you know, a, a relatively large city that will have different jurisdictions within it, you'll often have small changes in the laws as you're driving within the same city. Oh, totally. That's, that's a good point. So this exists already. Um, and it's kind of, you know, it's kind of a matter of degree and also a matter of the, the choice and, and the way that it, that it permeates every aspect of the world in, in, uh, in my books. Yeah, absolutely. So um, thank you so much for taking us through that. And just to go back a little bit to your experience and what has informed these books, uh, you're a humanitarian worker and you're also an author, PhD candidate. How have your work and studies informed the Sentinel Cycle? Um, in, a, in a lot of different ways. Uh, for one thing, as we were, we were talking, you know, part of the appeal of having a lot of different, very different governments to look at is, is the fun of it, of exploring different places. But then as a political scientist, you know, the other appeal to me is having kind of a laboratory in which to see what works and what doesn't. So, you know, one of the things that comes up when I talk about this is the potential for um, both segregation and a kind of bad government, you know, people who make poor choices about their government would have a lot more freedom to do so, as well as people who make good choices about their government. Um, but, you know, what's interesting to me from a political science side is, okay, well, you know, if you have so many different small governments, you have a much better way of figuring out whether they are actually bad choices or whether they're good choices. And, you know, what parts of them work well and what parts of them don't. Um, so, there's certainly a lot of political science and international relations and sociology involved in it. Um, and there's also a lot of, of my humanitarian work and particularly, you know, my experience of, of having worked and lived and studied and traveled in a lot of different places over the world. Um, I mean, I really tried to make it a global book, um, both, you know, there was, there's a certain amount of principle in that um, in terms of wanting to look at the future in a global way and not just focused on certain places. Um, there was also, you know, practically for the story that I wanted to tell, it was really important to look at this system as a global system. And so that required looking at it, um, looking at how it would function all over the world. It was very important to look at it as a system that allowed a lot of diverse interpretations. And so that required going to different places to see how different places would do this. Um, so, you know, the, the, depending on their history, depending on the kind of government that they had before this micro-democracy came into fashion, they could use it in very different ways. Uh, and, and certainly just, you know, the, the places themselves. I mean, I really enjoy 
writing about places that I, that I miss. Um, and especially, you know, it was particularly fun to try and think them into the future and see how that would work out. So that was a big influence as well. Oh, totally. And this is one of the things I love the most about cyberpunk is how much it lends itself to diversity and, and exploring all these different global initiatives or um, ideas. And it's so cool. And I, I think when you're talking about this as a laboratory, it's also such a conversation starter. And that probably feeds into the laboratory is just knowing what how people respond to different ideas too. Absolutely. Okay, so I think a lot of us in this cyberpunk community, we love exploring those system-oriented alternatives, just like you've been talking about. Uh, for example, I've been curious about the viability of the United States moving toward a non-party system. And it's just, it's something like you're talking about, something that I would love to see in a laboratory, because sometimes it just boggles my mind that we're voting for like a portfolio of issues instead of issue by issue. So things like that. Um, yeah, how can we, what real world government issues in our world have manifested themselves in your series? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a huge question because I think there's so many, there's so many things and there's so many different angles to look at on this. Um, and there's kind of macro systemic things and there's micro things as well. Um, so let me start by saying, as I was kind of touching on earlier that a lot of the changes that I suggest in the book, a lot of the situations that you see in the book are completely possible right now. As we said, you know, the, the sort of moving from government to government already happens. Um, the geographically distant government completely happens. We have Alaska, we have um, the Falkland Islands or the Malvinas, we have uh, Reunion Island, we have all these examples of governments, Gibraltar, that are, are far from their, their home government, and yet we still manage to they still manage to be governed and exist. So the geographical contiguity is also um, something that's perfectly, perfectly possible to, to happen now. So technically, um, although there are some technical advances in the book, they're more kind of facilitating and smoothing than actually making possible. Everything is, is really quite possible now, Techno technically, technologically. Politically is a very different story. So getting from where we are now to what is described in the book is the really challenging part. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's partly vested interest, um, mostly interests and power though. So when I, you know, in writing the book, what I was really hoping to do was, was kind of give a sense for the possibilities that exist um, that are very much within our reach and suggest some places where, you know, even if it's politically, um, very difficult to imagine moving from here all the way to there, particularly in a, in a sort of peaceful way, which is what we would want to happen. That there are places where we can tweak and there are places where we can incrementally um, try to optimize our, our politics because our, our politics right now are not optimized, like not even from a perspective no. of, <laughs> I know it's just shocking, right? But even totally aside from like partisan, whichever side you're on, just from a perspective of efficiency, um, I mean, it, you know, the, the <laughs> things like the amount of time that we let our campaigns run in the United States is just really appalling. Um, the, you know, the, the whole primary system, it's, yeah, there's, there's a lot um, to, to talk about there. Uh, and, you know, I think also that um, for me, in the book, you know, as, as, as is clear from the title, one, one of the really important systemic areas that I think we need to start thinking about is information. And this has just kind of exploded over the past couple of years, um, as we know. But it's been an issue for probably as long as there's been government. Uh, certainly, you know, even in our recent history, we can look back and, um, you know, people talk about how pressure my book was. I always mention things like the, the 2004 SWIFT voting, which was this um, false news fake news, false information event that was so kind of critical and important and widespread that it became a verb. And yet then was immediately forgotten so that we came up with the terminology all over again in the next cycle. Uh, and so this is, you know, the, the ways that we use information are, are really important. And right now they're largely determined by um, this kind of both, both the things I mentioned, the entrenched power structures and the kind of path dependency that says, you know, the, 
whether you want to look at regulations, whether you want to look at um, the economic structures, nothing has been able to keep up with how quickly the information systems have changed. And so, you know, there, I think it's um, really important to sort of step back and take new looks at how we want these things to run because nothing about the way our system is set up now is inevitable. Nothing about it is kind of a natural progression that's endogenous that we can't do anything about. We can make choices about the way our system works and there are many, many, many better versions that we could, I think, um, work towards. And sometimes I think we really disconnect from that and we really take it for granted. So mm -hmm. that's an awesome reminder. Thank you. <laughs> so um, this, this segues into a conference that you were involved in where I'm sure this was a topic and you were involved with the Future Focused Brave New World Conference. Could you, since I'm sure my listeners wish they could have been there with you, <laughs> and um, could you just share a couple of ideas that you shared there or any observations you have from that experience? Yeah, so firstly, I, it was a fantastic conference, and I know they're doing it again next year. So anyone who has an opportunity, it was, I thought, um, really worthwhile in terms of bringing together uh, people with a lot of different perspectives on different, different types of technological advances. Um, I mean... You can see the fact that they invited science fiction writers is obviously a great sign. <laughs> um, and they were also, I also really appreciated that they were, um, they worked very hard to have gender balance in their presenters. Um, so it was, you know, it was a great conference, a really great approach to, to having, you know, they made sure that they had like private sector and public sector and then sometimes some nonprofit or, or different perspectives on a lot of the issues that they talked about. Um, so we did talk a lot about these issues, um, particularly as we've just been discussing sort of the information side and particularly because, you know, it is a technology and futures conference, the specifics about the technology and how those um, change what, what's going on. Um, for me personally, and one of the things that I talked about was, um, while I think technology is important, I think it's also important to keep it in the, in the perspective that every technological advance that we've been through in the past in terms of information has had a similar effect. So, you know, television similarly is both very democratizing because it gets the information out quickly to anyone who wants it at a very cheap cost and can be incredibly authoritarian um, if it's controlled and used in that way. Radio, as you've seen, can be, uh, you know, an incredible tool for, for letting people know what's going on and can also be used in the service of genocide as we've seen in various places. Um, before that, you know, the printed word um, caused incredible people. And we've seen how books can be both, you know, I mean, we think of books, I think, as just a sort of um, perfect. It's like sacred. Yeah, good. Yeah, They're just yeah. always good. Um, probably orderly, good, maybe neutral good. Um, but they are, you know, books, books are good. But And yet we can look at history and there's plenty of uh, examples that we can think of where books were, used in the same way that fake news is being used now. Um, and you, they, and st they still are being used that way. You know, they are, I am certainly not arguing against books. I'm 100% for books, but we need to remember that any of these technologies can be used in positive and negative ways, in democratic or undemocratic ways. Um, and, you know, yes, each one has kind of specific characteristics that we need to learn how to manage and deal with. Um, but I am always wary of the kind of alarmism around a specific technology uh, because it's always happened before. Um, but there were also, there were a lot of other really, um, really interesting things that happened at this conference. There was one particularly, uh, they had a couple of cyborgs speaking. Um, there, there are a couple of people who have made themselves cyborgs. Uh, and one of the really interesting insights I found from that talk was that we tend to think of technology and nature as a dichotomy. And yet these people had specifically, you know, the, the types of, of, um, of amplifications and of modifications that they'd made to their body were specifically about knowing more about nature and being more connected um, to what was happening around them. So one of the, the cyborgs, Neil Harbison, um, was born without the ability to distinguish color. And so this isn't exactly a medical necessity, but it was, you know, his, his initial um, foray into becoming a cyborg had to do with, with something that was a medical difference in him. 
and he had an antenna implanted which uh, transmits color to him in the form of a frequency. So he um, hears color and he, he spoke a lot about the various ways in, that, in which that has changed his life. Um, and then there's another um, cyborg there who had uh, something implanted that made her very aware of earthquakes which as someone who's lived through a lot of earthquakes, I cannot imagine wanting to be more aware of the earth shaking than I already am. Um, but, you know, for her, it was something that, you know, connected her, connects her to the, 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 the way the, the planet is, is moving. And um, both of them can create art with their augmented senses. And so it was, you know, it, it, for me, it was a really interesting um, way of turning over some of the sort of classic science fiction tropes about um, and you can look these, these people up. They have extensive, um, they have Ted talks and they have extensive pages about their experience. So I don't, you know, I don't want to represent their experience too much since it's not mine, but, um, in terms of, of things I learned in the conference, that was very, uh, that was very interesting. There was also another, um, speaker, um, who, and I should be like citing all the names. It's, it's been a couple of months, I'll put so, in. Don't even worry. uh, who spoke about how, um, City blackbirds are actually genetically different from non-city blackbirds, even one that has, was born and raised in, a, in captivity and was not in the city environment will demonstrate the traits of a city blackbird. So talking about the way genetics, you know, sort of the received understanding on genetics and evolution is also something that's being overturned by a lot of things. So basically there was just a lot of people there who were talking about these sort of little or big mind blowing um, differences to, to what we think of as, as accepted in science. And so that was, it was just great. Oh, that's so cool. It totally made, motivates me to try to get there someday. So thank you. Yeah. Well, um, you know, reach out. They were, um, they were pretty great. So. Awesome. Wonderful. And so on that same note, as we record this at the beginning of 2018, and as we end this interview, what does the future of cyberpunk specifically look like to you? And what do you project for 2018 and beyond? Um, <laughs> well, you know, I wrote my, my books, 60 Years in the Future, kind of on purpose to give myself a little bit of margin. Because, uh, you know, I think as a science fiction writer, we know that we're not necessarily trying to predict the future in the first place. We're trying to talk about the present say we as most of us but obviously I'm speaking for myself um, but at the same time you don't necessarily want your future to be upended immediately so you kind of you give it a little bit of space for things to happen um, I'm not sure that what's happened since I wrote my book I think it's perhaps made it more likely rather than less um, but that's very hard to say at this point um, but in terms of you know what I see happening with cyberpunk, I think that I am hearing a lot more about the sort of things that that I'm very interested in um, that I that I wrote about with these books. I think politics and the issues of how we conduct our how we choose our leaders and how we uh, conduct our governance has become very relevant to everybody, um, and so that's something that I think we're going to see. You know, I think also maybe in the sort of more general sense of that, the way corporations and data and government are intersecting. Um, sometimes, you know, it's not specifically about politics in the sense of about an election, but certainly about politics in the sense of, you know, who's really in control? Um, is it, is it the, the corporations? Is it the governments? Is it the, the people who control the information? You know, if that means the, the news or, or some arm of government or a corporation. Um, and so on. So I think we're going to be, be seeing a lot more of that and a lot more about how cyber technologies influence those, those issues. Um, that said, though, you know, there's a lot of exciting areas of science and futurism for people to explore. And I think um, between what's happening with, I, there's just, there's so much, you know, there, there's, there's genetics and CRISPR, there's exciting things going on with, um, robotics and AI. And I, I kind of almost hesitate to say that because I think that there's a lot of alarmism right now in the non-science fiction community about AI that I uh, 
generally disagree with, but you know, you do see some amazing um, cyberpunk works like uh, Autonomous, which just came out, which is, you know, um, so good on those issues and on really connecting them to the larger issues of things like um, slavery and intellectual property and the different ways that we control knowledge. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of exciting stuff going on. So much. And now, Malka, we can strike this because I'm kind of going off script here. But um, mm-hmm. I also noticed in your book that you mentioned some pretty cool stuff like anaerobic generators, I think. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I had to look that up. I was like, oh, that's so cool. And so natural, so nature based. And also, I think you mentioned solar punk, solar, I say solar mm-hmm. punk, because that's one of the derivatives. Sure. Yeah. But yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of those things are already happening. I mean, I was uh, working with or looking at working with anaerobic reactor projects for energy generation on a small scale when I lived in Indonesia. So that was eight years ago now. A lot of the technology that will make our futures fascinating and that makes our science fiction fascinating is already happening, but it's happening either at a small scale or at a very expensive scale or at a not quite perfect situation where it needs to you know, be tied to something else or it needs the social uh, situation to catch up. And so you know, a lot of what I do as um, kind of, I mean, partly just because I like it and partly as, as a way to feed into my fiction is to just kind of try to read a lot of random articles or see a lot of uh, um, things that people are working on that are experimental that aren't there yet. I just saw a tweet from William Gibson actually referencing an architectural uh, show, exhibition that he went to in the 70s that he said really influenced his work, um, the models, the architectural models. And so, you know, I think the the message there for me is to kind of read widely and experience widely and and try to get a sense for all the little tiny projects that are going on um, that may not come to fruition exactly as they are but often have some value and you know even if they don't even if we don't end up going that particular path into the future an alternate future that uses them is perfectly respectable and 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 worth exploring so you know there's i tried to i tried to fit as many um, kind of cool, random, small ideas about what changes in the future are in as I could. And, you know, part of it was, was also, part of it is to make um, the future feel lived in and realistic and having lots of things going on that aren't the main point of the book. Um, but part of it is also because I really want people to look these things up. Um, and I also, so I want to give props to the people who are involved in them. So, you know, one technology in the book, Lumber, which is um, something that builds firearms. Um, and, you know, that's largely a narrative thing because I think fight scenes are much more interesting without guns. And also it's partly wishful thinking. Uh, but I named it after a researcher, Laura Lump, who works in small arms uh, the issue of international small arms and sort of control and, and the huge problems that small arms cause, uh, not just in the United States, but globally in, in, in conflict zones and in other areas. Um, and so, you know, I'm just, just trying to, to make sure that I connect it to the real efforts that are going on right now. That's also why, you know, I donate a percentage of my earnings from, from both my books, from Infomocracy, it goes to the Accountability Lab, which is this great organization that works on grassroots accountability and they have this thing called the Integrity Idol where uh, people nominate civil servants, um, you know, like really low-level civil servants who get no appreciation and do such important work uh, in making sure that, that communities and municipalities and countries run in a, in a productive way and in a positive way for people. Um, and then for null states, um, I'm donating to the Institute for Statelessness and Inclusion, which is um, working on helping stateless people uh, which is, a, you know, a special category, um, sometimes refugees, sometimes within their own country who don't have the, the benefits of citizenship and trying to make statelessness eventually uh, trying to eliminate it. Um, so because it's, it's really, I, you know, I want to connect people who find my books interesting to the real world ways in which people are working on these, these problems. Super cool. Well, Malka, I have absolutely learned so much just from talking to you. I've learned so much from reading your books, and I appreciate the work that you're doing. It is really important, and it's really expanded my life, and I'm so excited to share this. Where can readers go to connect with your work? Uh, Well, I 
do you have a website on WordPress, um, which is just under my name, Malka Older. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter, where I'm M underscore Older. And you can also look for the Infomocracy hashtag, which I use for anything that's relevant to the book. Um, and sometimes other people use too, which I think is even cooler. So please do if you see something relevant. Um, and you can look for my next book, State Tectonics, which closes out the trilogy uh, coming this fall. Oh, so exciting. So once again, thank you for your time and I hope you have a wonderful day. Great. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Oh, I absolutely love that interview and go ahead, head to storypunks.world forward slash audible. And whether you have a membership already or not, you can go there and connect with my list of punk related titles. And do you uh, have a few minutes right now? If you do, I would absolutely love it if you'd go to iTunes and then search for Story Punks. And once you find my show page, if you could just scroll to the bottom and leave a couple thoughts, a couple lines, or even if you just hit the stars, to be honest, and there's plenty of people downloading it. So the more people that will take a couple minutes, leave reviews, then even more people find it and we can expand this discussion more and more and more. So... Again, it's wonderful to have you here as always, and I hope you have a wonderful week.